Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Good evening. So we're in Hebrews 7. Hebrews 7 is a very interesting chapter uh, when you start talking about the Melchizedek who appeared in the Old Testament and all of a sudden disappeared. Uh, and that's going to be, it's a type of Christ. So we'll go in, and the chapter kind of explains a lot about Melchizedek. So chapter, so we, we, you know, uh, St. Paul kind of prepared us for Melchizedek uh, in the previous chapter. And, and also not only that, but just to remind you, is that he's writing this to the Hebrews, people that were Christian, people that were Jews became Christian, and their faith is shaken, and now they want to go back to Judaism. And here he's telling them that the priesthood of Jesus Christ is much superior uh, that, that was the, the beginning of the priesthood in the Jewish, uh, uh, in the Jewish religion. That the Aaron started. The, that was the, the everyone that was a priest came from the tribe of Levi and their descendants of Aaron. So, in that, in light of that, let's let's kind of go through the chapter. So he starts out chapter two. It says, "For this Melchizedek," and now he's going to explain who is Melchizedek. Melchizedek, and he says, "King of Salem." priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. We'll stop there. So here he's telling them about this character that appeared in the Old Testament, and you can read about it in uh, Genesis 14. That there is this king is it, well, he, uh, that, that you know, came back, uh, Abraham, I'm sorry, Abraham went to a slaughter. He was in a war and he was coming back and he encountered the, the it, it says priest Melchizedek. And he's explaining who is Melchizedek. What does the, ner, the, the name Melchizedek mean? Melik in Arabic, like king. Uh, Sitk, which is righteousness. Melchizedek. Or, in other words, he's also, he's calling him King of Salem. Uh, Salem meaning the King of Peace. Uh, when you say Jerusalem, Zalem is the peace, so the city of peace. Uh, so here he start, he's referring to him, Melchizedek is a king, is the, or the meaning of the name, King of Salem. And he refers to him, Priest of the Most High God. This is very interesting to the Jewish nation. Why? Because you cannot be a priest and a king at the same time. There is no such thing. Because what happens is, the priests come from specific tribe, and king comes from a different tribe. Priests come from the tribe of Levi, and kings come from the tribe of Judah. So to have someone that is a king and a priest, that's something that they don't understand, because that's not how it works. But here... This Melchizedek, the king of righteousness, the king of Salem, he is a king and he's a priest. Uh, so we're going to understand a little more why is that. So he's a king and a, and a priest. So it's his king of Salem and a priest of the Most High God. And then he tells us where he appeared. By the way, in, in Genesis 14, you'll find that all of a sudden that he appears uh, and, and, and Abraham the patriarch, the fathers of the fathers, whom we celebrate today, by the way. In the morning, if you were at the Divine Liturgy, we celebrate, we commemorate Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob today in our church. The patriarchs. Uh, so, he's saying that Abraham, the fathers of the fathers, when he encountered Melchizedek, he offered him tithes. You only offer tithes to those in the tribe of Levi, to priests. But you find that Abraham, the father of the fathers, offered him tribes. And not only that, but you find that Melchizedek blessed Abraham. And that was big because Abraham is the father of the, the, the Jewish nation. He's the father. And someone to bless Abraham, that someone had to be above Abraham. So in other words, Melchizedek, to bless Abraham, Melchizedek is higher than Abraham. And not only that, but when you read in Genesis 14, it says that Melchizedek offered bread and wine to Abraham. So this is priesthood, bread and wine. Okay, so here, and, and by the way, after that, he disappears. And also when you look in Chronicles, when you look at genealogy, 
uh, you will not find anything written about Melchizedek. There is no genealogy about Melchizedek. So he's a character and we say it's a type of Christ that appeared and he, his, his priesthood is much higher than the Levitical priesthood. So with that in mind, I think we'll kind of put some light on some of the things that we will be talking about. So again, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, and a priest of the Most High pre, uh, God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. So Melchizedek brass, blessed uh, Abraham, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth, which tithing, tenth is a tithing, part of all first being translated king of righteousness. So in other words, he's also Melchizedek means kings of righteous, king of righteousness or king of Salem. And then also king of Salem. So king of righteousness, king of Salem. Meaning king of peace. We said Salem mean peace, so king of peace. And then he talks to us a little more about this Melchizedek. In verse 3 it says, Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God. So here he's referring to this uh, Melchizedek. It's God characters. What are God characters? No father, no mother. Uh, the God character is that no beginning, no end. So here he's talking about Melchizedek. It's basically the Son of God. It's, it's a type of son, the Son of God, which is Jesus Christ. So he says, but there's no genealogy to him, even when you look through Chronicles. By the way, Chronicles was really important for them. Why? Because to be a priest, you had to be from the tribe of, Le uh, of, uh, the tribe of Levi. And if you're, not a, if you're not part of this tribe of Levi, you cannot become a priest. So it was very important that they kept track of genealogy in order for them to identify who's the tribe of Levi, who's the tribe of, of this tribe, and so on. So here you find this character is without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, God characters, but like the Son of God. And not only that, but the priesthood of Aaron had a beginning the pri I'm sorry, the priesthood of the, the Levite had a beginning and had an end. So when did the priesthood start? It, it, stopped, it started with Aaron the priest. That's when, that's when the priesthood started. And the priesthood in the Jewish nation stopped. And when did it stop? It stopped when they d destroyed the temple in 70 AD. When they, when they came, when the Romans came in, and uh, they, they entered into Jerusalem, and they destroyed the whole temple in 70 AD, there is no sacrifices being offered. So from 70 AD till now, the, in, in the Jewish uh, religion, there are no sacrifices being offered anymore. Why? Because the temple has been destroyed. And the only place that you offer sacrifices to the Jewish nation was in the temple. So the priesthood of Aaron... Aaron started it and it ended with the destruction of the temple. But the thing is with this priesthood of Melchizedek, it says in the last uh, part of that last verse that we just covered, verse 3, it says, his priesthood remains a priest continually. So here he's, changed, he's telling them that the priesthood of Melchizedek is not like Aaron priesthood. It had a beginning, it had an end, but the priesthood of Melchizedek, it's continuing. And then he starts talking about this type of Christ, this Melchizedek. In verse 4 it says, Now consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch, patriarch meaning patriarch is the father of the fathers, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoil. So he's telling him how great of a man this is, this Melchizedek, that the father of the fathers tied to him. Okay? offered him the tenth. And then it says, and indeed those who are the sons of Levi who receive the priesthood have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law that is from the brethren though they have come from the loins of Abraham but he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. So what does this say? So here he's telling them that Abraham, uh, who is the father of the fathers, offered tithing to this uh, Melchizedek. And he's basically telling them, he's saying indirectly that just that somebody 
from the tribe of Levi offering tithes. Who, the Levi is the one that will accept the tithes. But here he's saying that they offered. So indirectly, Abraham, uh, on behalf of Levi, that comes later, offered tithing to, to this Melchizedek, which means, that means Melchizedek is higher. It says, but he whose genealogy is not derived from them, from the tribe of Levi. And here he's saying two things, that this Melchizedek received the tithes from Abraham and then blessed him who had the promise. So in other words, he blessed Abraham who had the promise. Remember, we spoke about the promise last week. Last week, what was the promise of Abraham? That the Lord will bless him and he will bring, give it from his seed. The, the, his children and the future generation will be like the stars. He had that promise. So here he's saying this Melchizedek, bless the one who had the promise. Verse 7, it says, Now beyond all contradiction. So he's telling them common sense now. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. So in other words, when, you, when somebody blesses, it's always the superior blesses the less. So here he's giving them an example that in common sense is that basically the lesser, uh, it says, let's see what, Bless him who had promises. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. So in other words, if Melchizedek blessed Abraham, that means Melchizedek is superior than Abraham, who is who they consider in a Jewish nation, father of the fathers. So in other words, Melchizedek is superior. He's, he's telling them that that's the common sense tells us. And then in verse 8 it says, here, mortal men, he's talking about the Levi, the, 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 the tribe of Levi and, and specifically Aaron's family who, who are the priests. It says, here mortal men receive tithes. In other words, those who, the descendants of Aaron who were priests, uh, they receive tithes. But there he receives them of whom it is witness that he lives. Even Levi who receives tithes, Pay tithes through Abraham, so to speak. For he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So in other words, he's saying even though that the, the, the tribe of Levite, it's coming later and the priesthood of Aaron, because Abraham, their father, offered tithes to Abraham, indirectly, Levites also offer tithes. So therefore, Melchizedek is superior than the priesthood of Aaron. And then verse 11, it says, Therefore, if perfection... By the way, perfection is always accomplishing the goal, uh, meeting the, the goal of whatever it is. So uh, keep that in mind. Therefore, if meeting the goal, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called not be called according to the order of Aaron. So here he's telling them, he's giving them the, the clear understanding is that the priesthood of Aaron came through the law. Came through the law in the sense that uh, the, the law was given and they followed the law. But that priesthood did not perfect things. Uh, in other words, it did not completely save the person. So uh, in other words, so here what you see is that uh, it's a temporary priesthood. So it came through, they received the law. Uh, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek uh, and not be called according to the order of Aaron. So ultimately what he's explaining here is that this priesthood of Melchizedek, it was mortal men, men that, the, that lived and died after that. Priests that died. They collected the tithes, they prayed on behalf of the people, but they were mortal. So in other words, it did not perfect salvation. So it had to be another priesthood that perfects it, that accomplishes the goal. What is the goal? It's to save man. And, and, and how does that work? Is that through the priesthood of Melchizedek, who, which is the type of Christ, which Christ is the one that came and saved us and died on the cross. So we'll go through it really fast. It says, for the priesthood being changed of necessity, because it was not a perfect priesthood. For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe. So he's talking about Melchizedek, uh, the king of Salem. He also belongs to another tribe. From which no man 
has officiated at the altar. In other words, like for instance, those who from the tribe of Judah, those who were kings, no one from the tribe of Judah officiated sacrifice. Why? Because they were not from the tribe of Levi. They were pride of Judah. So in other words, Jesus Christ came from the tribe of Judah. Okay, that's the, he's because he, that's a king. But also, he is also a priest and a king, just like he, under that priesthood of like Melchizedek is, who is a type of Jesus in the Old Testament. Verse 14, it says, For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah. So he's telling them that Jesus Christ arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. So here he's telling them that when Moses was talking about the tribe of Judah, nothing when it came to priesthood was from the tribe of Judah. Nothing spoke concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come not according to the law of the fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, and then he tell, he, he's going to say a verse and he's going to quote a psalm. It says, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And we say that, by the way, when a bishop is here or, 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 or a pope, we always refer to this, and it's from Psalm 110. It says that you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So in, a, in other words, this priesthood is not from flesh. Uh, it's, it's not from something that it has a beginning and an end. But it's an endless priesthood. It's a, there's no end to it. Okay? So, but according to the power of an endless life. And what is that in Christ? You see, what is that endless life? Is that the resurrection and the ascension and sitting at the right hand of the Father and it's endless. It doesn't have a beginning and it doesn't have an end. Verse 18, it says, For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. So in other words, the previous word, the, the priesthood of Aaron was more or less annulled because it was weak, it did not fulfill, it did not accomplish the goal. It was temporary. For, one of, for on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. In other words, it did not profitable, it did not accomplish the goal. And there had to be another priesthood that is endless, that is, that is, that is perfected. Okay? Verse 19, it says, For the law made nothing perfect. So, in other words, it, it, it did not fulfill God's goal. The law did not fulfill God's goal. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope. So, in other words, there is salvation. What is our hope? Is the salvation, which he spoke about last, last chapter. It says, it is the bringing in of another hope through which we draw near to God. There is a crying room upstairs. You can take him to the crying room upstairs. Okay? Yeah, there is uh, upstairs on the second floor. So it says here that there is, there is, there is a, we, now this, this priesthood, it has hope in it. There is a, an endless, there is hope in that, okay? And then in verse 20, it says, Inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath. When you look at the priesthood of Aaron, uh, there was an oath that had to go with it. And Abraham, there was an oath that, that, that you know, he swore that you're the end. But here it's without an oath. For they have become priests without an oath, but he was an oath by him who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Verse 22, and it's the, the chapter is ending. And uh, verse 22, it basically, it's going to talk about the blood of Christ if you're washed by his blood. It says, by so much more, Jesus, by the way, keep in mind that Hebrews... He's talking to people that are going back to Judaism. Who is the father of the Judaism? Is the father is Abraham as their father. And what he's trying to convince them is the priesthood of Christ is much superior of, the, of Abraham and the tribe of Levi. Keep that in mind because that's what he's convincing them. It says, by so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. So the old covenant, and so this is why we say this is the blood of the new covenant. Uh, the old covenant was not perfected. It was not. It was not. It didn't accomplish the the goal, uh, and 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 it did not. So there had to be a new covenant, and the new covenant was through the blood of Jesus Christ. That was the new covenant. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death 
from continuing. In other words, a lot of priests had to exist from the tribe of Aaron because a lot of them, they die because they're human. They're, so they're mortal, that they die. So there had to be a lot of them. So also there were many priests because they were prevented by death continuing from continuing. So they couldn't continue forever. But he, meaning Jesus Christ, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. So in other words, that priesthood of Melchizedek, that, that is the type of Christ, it's unchangeable and in the sense that it, it, it's forever. And then verse 25, it says, Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. The priests of the Old Testament, they, they live and they die, but here the Christ he said, always lives and he is able to make intercession for them now that he's sitting on the right hand of the Father throughout, so forever. So he, that he's able to, it's a, there, that's the surety of it, that it's an always uh, priest that he's, he's living forever and there's always continuity. And then he, if he finishes the chapter in verse 26. It says, For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy. Now he's giving the what, what the, the, the the characters of Christ, that priesthood, is that that high priest of, of that, that is after the Melchizedek, is that for such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. When you look at Christ, Christ was not, and basically we're all, He took our human humanity, but he did, not, he did not sin. He was like us in everything except for sin. So He was separated from sinners. And has become higher than the heavens. By the way, the separate from sinners also could be described that when he ascended into the heavens, he took our humanity up to heaven and he was separate from us sinners. But also, he, he is also without sin. So there's two ways of looking at it. That now that he's up, he's separated from the sinners, but has become higher than the heavens. Which meaning sitting on the right hand of the Father. Verse 27, it says, Who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices. First for his own sins, and then for the, for the people. Why he's saying daily here? In the Old Testament, the priests used to offer sacrifices daily, regularly. The high priesthood of Christ is basically, it was one sacrifice, one sin for all. In other words, that sacrifice that we offer on the altar, it's not a new sacrifice. No, we're actually tapping in into the sacrifice on the cross. In other words, the body and the blood that is offered today, we are not, it's a new, not a new sacrifice. The sacrifice was offered once on the cross, and it's not basically, it's not daily. So it's offered once. But the old one, it, they had to offer sacrifices regular and after, uh, under the priesthood of Aaron. Let's say, first, and, and, and what they used to do, by the way, in the Old Testament, is that these priests, they would offer sacrifices for their own sins and for the sin of the people. But here he's saying that Christ, it's, he's offering, he's offering his, his body as a sacrifice for the sins of the people, not for himself. Okay, and that's what, that's what he's talking about. For the law uh, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer and sacrifices, first for his own sin and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. And this is, he's talking about the Lord, the sacrifices once, and we tap, we live it, we relive it, we tap into it again every time when we, we celebrate the Eucharist. And then in verse 28 it says, and he's describing two things now. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness. So after the law, it's basically the, the, the law uh, appoints priests that are men that are weak, okay? And then the set that he's comparing it to the high, the, the, the high priest uh, of Melchizedek and, or Jesus Christ, the type of Jesus Christ, it says, but the word. So he's referring, the, you know, he's comparing between the law and the word. But the word of the oath which came after the law, and now this is the new covenant, appoints the son, which is Jesus Christ. Instead of men, mortal men, now it's the son, Jesus Christ, who has been perfected forever. So here he's, he's comparing, you know, the, the priesthood in the Old Testament. In, 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 in Aaron, it was men more, that are mortal, which the law appointed, and they were weak. But then in the New Covenant, in, under the priesthood of, of Melchizedek, it's an oath 
uh, that, that, that God uh, had, like what he, he said, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So it's an oath uh, which came after the law appoints son who has been perfected. In other words, Jesus Christ was perfected. And not only mortal men, but the last word that it's a perfected forever. Okay, It's a little tough of a chapter, but it gives us light of this character of Melchizedek that you always hear when the bishop is here, or you'll hear it a lot in the, in the, in the Bascha week. You hear a lot about, about Melchizedek. So chapter 7 kind of gets very deep into that character. So ultimately, the Melchizedek, we believe, it's a type of Christ in the Old Testament, and it's a priesthood forever, and it's fulfilled in Jesus Christ, who is the one uh, that he gave his life on the cross as a sacrifice, and it's forever, and his pre high priesthood has no end. Anyone have any questions? Any questions? And all the glory be to God forever. I mean, let's pray. Make us worthy, O Lord, to pray. Thanks to our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespass. We forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not in temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. Thine is the kingdom, power, and glory for us. Now the love of God the Father, the grace of His only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ, the communion and gift of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you.